Okay, let's try this again. Let's see here. Hi, Carrie. <laughs> oh, you guys, we are trying to figure out how to get Dr. Amon on here. He has to be watching um, the Instagram Live. We're having technical difficulties. Um, but I get to say hello to all of you. So basically, Dr. Amen, as I was saying, he's with the Amen Clinic. We are talking with him about how to stay mentally healthy in these absolutely insane times. And he uh, did a brain scan on me, and there he is. Here we go. <laughs> Let's see. Aw, <laughs> oh, Carrie, thank you. She said, your laugh is making me laugh. There he is. Oh, it's so good to see your face again. It's like a, a reassuring smile, I feel like. How are you? How are you holding up? Hi, Lynn. Oh, it's been quite the roller coaster. So um, I've had loved ones with COVID and, uh, you know, we have eight clinics and one of our staff ended up in the hospital in Manhattan. That was horrifying. And uh, we're working and we're hearing about a lot of pain. And so uh, now more than ever, you need strategies to get your brain and your mind healthy. Yeah, that was why I just felt it was so important to talk to you in this time. You have been just following you on Instagram. You have been a source of comfort um, and reminders on how we need to be staying mentally healthy. But how do we do that? Um, walk us through some of those things. Let's start with just the basics. We are scared. We're overwhelmed. Uh, in many cases, we're caring for others who are scared and overwhelmed. What are just some of the tools that you would recommend for us to get through this really challenging time? Well, you know, when this first happened, I wrote at the top of my to-do list every day, mental hygiene is just as important as washing your hands that we literally need to disinfect our thoughts. I call it kill the ants. So we're going after bugs and ant stands for automatic negative thoughts, the thoughts that come into your mind just automatically and ruin your day. Uh, I'm gonna be bankrupt, I'm gonna be sick, uh, my children will fall behind. All of the negativity that's running in your head and what I found is that when you write it down and then you challenge it, you're, you're not controlled by your fear. And so, um, actually I have a kid's book. I don't know if I sent it to you called Captain Snout and the Superpower Questions. It's how to teach children um, how to get rid of the ants. And Captain Snout is the hero. Uh, he's an anteater. Um, and, and it's so important. So if we just start with learning to manage our minds, that it, it'll just help us so much. Early in the pandemic, one of my friends texted me, is Amen Clinics going to survive? And, and I had actually not had one thought that we wouldn't. You know, I was beginning to think, oh my goodness, how are we going to manage so many people who have anxiety, depression, and fear? But if I would have let that thought seep into my mind, it would have started to color every decision I made. And then I would have been managing out of anxiety and fear rather than out of what was true, which is we're going to be fine. We just have to help a lot of people who are not. That's one of the things my mom said to me early on in the pandemic. I was just, I would call her and I'm like, I just, I'm so overwhelmed. I, and, and I'd go through all of the things that I was afraid of. And she's like, do you notice that all of these things haven't happened? All of the things that you're saying, they have not happened. So just take each day and think about what's happening each day. Don't think about what is happening tomorrow or the next day or what could happen. And that's managing those thoughts is what I find the most challenging is how do you stop yourself when you're having that, well, this, now this is going to happen. And what, what happens if this happens, all of which doesn't, 
usually. It's not the worst case. And even if it does, you manage your way through it. So how do you stop yourself from well, going down I, that rabbit hole? So I don't want you to ignore the thoughts. I actually want you to confront them. And uh, I don't know if when you were a teenager, you were good at talking back to your parents. I was excellent. <laughs> and, um, but no one ever taught me to talk back to myself. And so when I get a bad thought, if I'm disciplined enough to just write it down, and then I take it through a process of five simple questions. Like, is it true? I mean, like, go after it right away. And if it's true, because it might be, well, is it absolutely true with 100% certainty? How does the thought make me feel? Usually awful. How would I feel if I didn't have the thought? Awesome, free. And then my favorite part of the questions is take the original thought Amen clinics will fail and turn it to the opposite. Amen clinics will not fail and just go, do you have any evidence that's true? And if you take the thought captive, then it won't control you. But the problem is people get overwhelmed and then they medicate their thoughts with alcohol, with marijuana, with food, with pornography, with whatever that really is a short-term fix, but a long-term problem. And I want us to feel better now and later, as opposed to now, but not later. Let's talk about that because a lot of people are self-medicating right now. And actually a couple of our viewers here um, are asking about certain medications. We have viewers right now from Jerusalem, uh, Canada, England, they've all chimed in. And one in particular is asking a lot about medications like Xanax, um, also our self-medication with alcohol. It's the easiest thing to do. It's what a lot of people are doing right now. Why is it so dangerous? Well, let's, let's take them each. Um, Xanax is addictive. Uh, Xanax came onto the market in the early 1980s when I was a psychiatric resident. And so I learned to use a lot of it. And I stopped early in my career because once I started it, I couldn't get people to stop it. And then they needed more and more to get the same effect. And if you're a woman in your early 40s, Odds are what's happening besides the pandemic is your progesterone levels are going low. And that's when progesterone sort of our natural Xanax. And when it goes low, women begin to feel anxious and irritable and they can't sleep. And so then they start medicating with Xanax or alcohol when if they took a little progesterone, if they talk to their doctor about taking a little progesterone, it would calm them, but it is in fact not addictive and healing for the brain. You want your hormones to be right. Um, I'm not a fan of benzos like Xanax. I try to avoid them whenever I can. Um, alcohol is sort of a legal form of Xanax. And um, the one part about this pandemic, there's so many fascinating parts, is alcohol companies have gotten into the disinfectant business. Um, and you've probably reported on that. Um, so Jim Beam sanitizer. So why is that a problem to drink alcohol? Because it begins to kill the bugs. Well, you have 100 trillion bugs in your gut and they're called the microbiome and they're really important. They make neurotransmitters, they digest your food, they detoxify you, they protect the lining of your gut. Um, and so not only is drinking addictive and it's empty calories that put more weight on your body. So who's the group that's dying with COVID-19, the people who are obese? Um, it, 
causes you to make bad decisions because it drops the function of the front part of your brain. And in a pandemic, so when do you think your decision making needs to be the best it's ever been in right. your life? It's during a pandemic. You you need to make good decisions. It's often life or death, bankruptcy or not. It's you know raising healthy kids or unhealthy kids and alcohol is not going to serve you when there are all sorts of ways to calm you down and i love uh in my book feel better fast and make it last i talk about the ultimate brain based therapy which means flood each of your five senses with happiness and so on your phone you should get a happy photo album right what are the best memories uh that you have and you know you have pictures of your kids when they were babies or when they were doing funny silly things and also images of nature or fractals which are never ending patterns calm people down and make them happy so be careful what you're watching listen um, I've actually, I don't know if we ever talked about this, but I produced three albums, which is music directed to soothe or stimulate the brain. And it was Billboard's number six, New Age Artists of the Year last year That's for cool. an album that we had, which is I really fun. That. And so music helps you or it can hurt you. Certain scents like lavender, Honeysuckle, vanilla um, have been shown to help balance the brain, especially lavender. There's actually two studies in The Lancet showing it helps with sleep and mood. Um, touch, massage, uh, if you have that or going in a hot tub or a sauna can be super helpful. And certain tastes like cinnamon have been shown, nutmeg have been shown to help. So, you know, I just see sitting in the sauna, listening to the Beach Boys, good vibrations, uh, looking at something beautiful, uh, having, uh, when my wife gets up in a little bit, I'm gonna make her uh, an almond milk decaf uh, pumpkin spice cappuccino. She came up with the recipe. <laughs> and this the is how I tell her. The Amen I'm... house is a lot better than the mornings here. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then, you know, another thing I do, I have these little tiny habits and they so help me because this has not been an easy time for, for us. It's I start every day when my eyes wake up, when my eyes open, I go, today is going to be a great day. And, um, and, and there's been a lot of hard times, but there's also been a lot of awesome times. I get to talk to you. Um, Miley Cyrus is a patient of mine. She came out recently. And the Wall Street Journal yesterday just did a whole piece on her and her series that I helped her create called Bright Minded. And so if you just start your day with today is going to be a great day, then your unconscious mind begins to figure out, well, why is it gonna be a great day? And then when I go to sleep, even through hard days, I put myself to sleep with a prayer and what went well today. Because it sets my dreams up to be more positive. And an another simple tiny habit, all of us have been traumatized. I, I don't know one person in my life that hasn't gone through significant trauma. But when the trauma comes up and you can't stop thinking about it, I just want people to do this, just from your shoulders to your elbows, because when you think about the trauma and you stimulate both sides of your hemispheres at the same time, the, the emotion with the trauma begins to go down. And so just simple, things. And then the big thing no one's talking about that's sort of irritating me. I posted on Facebook a live chat. It was sort of a rant. It's we're spending trillions of dollars and people are running. Is it this medicine or that medicine? Is it this vaccine? And nobody's talking about, okay, who dies with COVID? It's not just the elderly. 
It's the elderly with multiple medical conditions. Well, why the heck aren't we getting ourselves healthy as a population? What's that about? It's no one's really talking about, well, how do we manage diabetes or how do we prevent obesity? Um, how do we get hypertension under control? I hear absolutely nothing about diet, exercise, simple supplementation. Um, every one of your viewers should know their vitamin D level and they should optimize it. And if it's me, for my patients, I tell them, you should take it a minimum 2,000 units a day. And a lot of my patients need seven to 10,000 units. But if you're just gonna start, there's evidence, um, there's a study from Indonesia, the people who died had significantly low vitamin D levels. And vitamin D is one of those hormones that not only supports your brain, it supports your immune system. And that's another thing when it comes to drinking so much or just not being healthy, your immune system goes down, you're more susceptible to this, and you make such a good point that no one really is addressing the elephant in the room, that the underlying conditions are really what's making some. I mean, your parents survived COVID, and we'll get to that in just a moment, but one thing I keep seeing people pop up and talking about is, what if I'm addicted? What? How do I go cold turkey on something like an alcohol or Xanax that, that is really their crutch right now to go to this lifestyle that you're talking about that makes so much sense in, in how we're gonna get healthy, but how do we let go of what we've held on to? Well, and that's where therapists can help. And, you know, almost all of our therapy now is virtual, but because uh, it makes people feel safe. Even though the clinics are open and we're scanning, we do what we do. Um, therapists around the world are embracing telemedicine. And there was one article in the BBC that said telemedicine made 10 years of progress in a week. And so, uh, so calling your therapist, getting on a video conference with them to help you. And for both alcohol and Xanax, if you've been doing a lot of that, don't just stop because that can trigger problems. You can cut it down by five and within three weeks. Um, as long as you're doing other things to replace um, what you're using those for, you can taper off of those things. But um, if you're dependent on them, if you're on Xanax, hopefully you're getting it from a doctor. So you should be talking to the doctor about, okay, exactly. what's the best therapist you know? I mean, you and I both know this. The smartest people we know talk to the smartest people they know. Um, and so getting help is not a sign of weakness. It's a sign of strength. If you just imagine, you know, business is having trouble and the business owner ignores the trouble, they end up bankrupt. Um, if you ignore the trouble in your life and you don't get the help you need, then you're likely to be emotionally bankrupt. And that's something that I talked about in my last Instagram live with Koi Bowles, he was really open about his own experience with therapy. I was open as well because as a mother, my role is basically to solve all everyone's problems. I answer all the questions, I handle everything. They look to me for just, where, where's this, where's that? I need an hour where somebody's answering my questions <laughs> or somebody's hearing me. And it, I can't tell you, I, I just hope that being open about that is motivating for other people to seek help in that way because it is so invaluable and it is one of those things where it's like it's like taking your vitamins and you talk about taking your supplements and taking all these things it's what gets you healthy mentally um you know you talked a little bit about working with miley cyrus and you know, she's one of her clients also justin bieber has been and i was so fascinated when you and i talked the first time about how you worked with them through their addictions and also through their trauma and fame and things like that. How, how are you working with them in this time? And, you know, celebrities go from like, everything is about them and they're everywhere. Now they're in their homes and nobody is paying attention to them. What, what is that like? 
well, helping them know that fame can actually damage your brain. Um, fame actually wears out the pleasure centers in your brain and leaves you vulnerable to anxiety, depression, and addiction. And uh, teaching them about brain healthy habits to kill the ants um, has just been so helpful. And they're both purposeful people. So by them coming out and sharing it, they realize that that will help other people, which then helps them because they love that. Um, and, uh, you know, I remember once Smiley was mourning the loss of a normal adolescence. And I just, I smiled and I said, you know, actually most people don't like their adolescence. <laughs> That's one of the hardest times in our whole lives. Um, and you got to avoid that. So helping them reframe what has happened to them in their lives is, is hard. And initially for both of them, they're sort of hard to catch. You know, they want to be well and then they wouldn't show up for a long time. Um, but when the pain got intense enough and they trusted me enough, it's okay, help. And, and Justin said something really important. Uh, he came into my office and he said, you know, my brain can have problems just like my heart can have problems. And if you told me I had heart problems, I'd do everything you said. He said, I'm going to start doing everything you say. And that really helped. And I, and I think for Justin, marrying Haley um, was a game changer for him because, uh, you know, many people don't know that men who are married uh, actually live longer than men who are not married. Uh, women who are married do not live <laughs> longer. That's because be we're taking care of all of you guys. Because they have to take care of us. <laughs> we're making your doctor's um, appointments. <laughs> but, but she is just such a wonderful human being. And she's consistent, reliable, predictable, and yes, she's beautiful and smart, but uh, she really elevated him in so many ways. I think right now is a time when all of us are leaning on whoever we can to help us through. Um, what about those that are going through this alone? Um, how, how do you advise someone who's lonely, is quarantined, can't interact with people, they don't have that support system. So introverts are actually doing really well because they get energy from being alone and it's stressful for them to be with other people. So not everybody's having a hard time with this has been my experience. Extroverts are really in trouble. <laughs> and I hate the term social distancing because it's wrong. It's physical distancing. What we need is physical distancing, not social distancing. We need to be socially connected more than ever. And this is really a great thing about technology. I mean, I've been worried about technology for a long time because it's addictive that when our iPhones were created, they were created to increase mind share for Apple and Samsung and all the device companies. Um, but now that we have them, you're in Atlanta, I'm in California, we can see each other, we can talk to each other. My grandbabies are in Oregon, uh, two of them, but I can see them, I can talk to them. We need to be socially connected. And whatever way you can reach out, either it's through church and small groups or um, volunteering, uh, it's just the way to stay connected because loneliness is a risk factor for Alzheimer's disease. And we, we need to be reaching out and being connected. And also it, it helps the person that you're reaching out to. It helps us too. Doing good things for other people makes you feel good. As you mentioned, uh, when, when you said some of the people that you've been working with, 
they've reached out and they, they get that great feeling when somebody's helped by what you're doing. Like even some of the people that are chiming in in the comment section, and please feel free to ask a question of Dr. Amen, they are all saying the same thing of just how much they appreciate this kind of connection. They're talking to each other, they're giving each other support. Um, you know, one of the things that we, I don't think has been talked about very often and is so important are our healthcare workers. And, you know, they, they aren't sitting at home and need the social connection. They are basically, it's like tours of war. They're going into these situations where they see the worst of the worst. PTSD is no doubt going to be something that we see down the road for them. And they don't have time to even really process what they're going through. They're on shifts all day long and, and they don't really have the time to get help. I mean, what do you think we need to be doing for our healthcare workers in this time? So I think of them. So I, I was an army trained psychiatrist. I trained at the Walter Reed Army Medical Center. And you're right. I think of the healthcare workers. Um, I mean, it's really, it's this double edged sword in that many healthcare workers are being laid off because they're not doing regular medicine. Elective right? surgeries, right. Elective surgery, but a lot of regular medicine because patients are just, they're afraid to go to the hospital, they're afraid to go to the doctor's office there. And so many medical businesses have really uh, been in trouble. And so a lot of healthcare workers have that anxiety. And then those on the front lines of COVID-19, um, they're often afraid every day, just like soldiers in war. And so the first published paper I ever did was 1982, and it's on who develops post-Vietnam stress disorder and who doesn't. And it's really about the brain you brought in to the theater of war, the trauma. If those who, had, who were healthy did much better than those who weren't. So giving them the opportunity to get both physically and emotionally healthy is, is just what we need to do. My wife's a neurosurgical ICU nurse and they didn't give her any training before they put her in the ICU on how to manage grief, trauma, and loss. And uh, it's just insane when you think about it. I mean, we know these are traumatic situations. It's like firefighters. I work with police officers and firefighters a lot. They have double the risk of suicide. And so we need to do a better job of all of our first responders, including especially now our healthcare workers, of teaching them how to manage their minds and also increase the health of their brains and bodies. I hope that they are focusing on that. You know, I. I was reading the story of the ER nurse in New York who took her own life and it's just something right now where they are putting their health and safety at risk and their family's health and safety at risk. And, and I just don't hear enough about how we can get them help. I hope we do in, in the next months to come. I hope we pay a little bit of attention to that. Um, our children, I really wanted to get some advice from you on how to better parent in a pandemic. <laughs> Um, and help their mental health. It's, you know, completely um, uncharted territory. There's no book on how to do this because we've all never gone through it. So how do you advise we keep them mentally healthy? You know, it's a great opportunity. It's actually a historic opportunity um, to increase the bond between parents and children. Now, we're in a pandemic. So grace is where we should start. <laughs> you know, you're in a pandemic. Like whenever I go overseas on a trip, I just think to myself, 10 things are gonna go wrong. So I'm actually not going to be upset until the 11th thing goes wrong. And in the pandemic when it started, so in my house, my wife, we have a 16 year old daughter and we adopted our two nieces who are 10 and 15. And so it's sort of a busy house. And, and I said, you know, you guys are going to have meltdowns. I'm probably going to have a meltdown. And you get one a week. More than that, it's a problem. <laughs> and so, 
And I think in the seven or eight weeks we've been doing this, you know, everybody's had one or two. And so as long as you expect things are going to be not great in a stressful situation, then you're not stressed by every little thing that happens. But given that we've had two parent working families for three generations now, and you know this because you work hard and you have kids and a husband and you're tired because you just, you know, there's that guilt. Am I ever doing enough? And now you have all this time and bonding requires two things. And one of them is time, actual physical time. The second thing is a willingness to listen. So when the kids say something, you don't talk over them, but you begin to repeat back what they say. So they believe you actually what they have to say. Th those two things will increase the bond. And I would argue if our bond with our children is better, their mental health challenges will go down. And so I've taught parenting for a very long time and the rules are still the same. It's like, know what you want. What kind of parent do you want to be? What kind of child do you want to raise? Write it down. And then you ask yourself when you're about to yell at them, is this going to get me what I want, either as a parent or developing a child? So know what you want, bond with them, time and listening. And even during the pandemic, 20 minutes a day with each of the kids, spend 20 minutes a day, just do something with them that they want to do, because then you can hear from them what they're thinking about in this stressful time. And then post clear rules, I have rules up uh, downstairs, like we treat each other with respect. And so, you know, one of the kids hits the others. I mean, mine are old enough, they don't do that. But it's mm -hmm. like, oh no, we don't do that. And there's consequences. But consequences actually don't come till later. It's post rules and then notice what you like more than what you don't like. This is how they shape dolphins at SeaWorld, it's how mm -hmm. we shape dogs. Uh, you know, no trainer ever shapes uh, behavior by beating people. And I actually just had an interesting conversation about spare the rod and spoil the child. You know, people uh, quote that all the time from the Bible. Most people yeah. don't know it's actually not in the Bible. Um, that it came from Samuel Butler when he wrote a poem about doing evil things to his partner. It was really interesting that a rod, think of what's a shepherd's rod, they don't ever use it to beat sheep. They use it to guide sheep or to rescue sheep if they, so I'm just in a pandemic when you're drinking or smoking pot, I'm never a fan of hitting children. It just, it makes them afraid of you now, I'm a fan of disciplining, because what does discipline mean? It means to teach. And I'm a huge fan of my friend, Jim Fay. He wrote a book called Love and Logic. You know, it's like, what's the book. logical consequence to yeah. this behavior? And it works so well in my house. My daughter knew if she didn't bring either homework to school or lunch to school, her mother was not going to school to bring it to her. And so she held the anxiety for her life as opposed to her mother holding the anxiety for her life. And just a fun um, example is they used to fight about homework when Chloe was in second grade. And uh, my wife didn't listen to me, but she listened to Jim Fay, thank God. And so one day she just announced, uh, I'm never going to bother you to do your homework again. It's your homework. I pass second grade. And if you're okay with the consequences of your teacher being upset with you, or I guess now they're not going out for recess, um, and you're a really nice child. So if you have to repeat second grade, you'll make new friends. And giving her the anxiety in 11th grade, she's a straight A student, and she's concerned about it, but there's no fighting. And what we want, because our goal is to make Chloe responsible for her life, and you want to teach them young when the um, 
consequences are cheap, right? Not having your lunch or not having your schoolwork. Uh, that's a cheap consequence as opposed to you blame other people for how your life is turning out. My mom always said, I'm trying to parent myself out of a job. Uh, and, and she really did, uh, you know, she helped me become really self-sufficient in that way. No Drama Discipline is another great book. I have Love and Logic. I just started No Drama Discipline. Um, it's the same philosophy of acknowledging the feeling, setting the limit, following through on consequences. If there need to be consequences, not everything has to be consequences. I also think it's really important to point out for all the parents out there, nobody, even the people that wrote that book, as they said in the book, follows it all the time. Sometimes we end up screaming because it is just the, the last <laughs> straw and we you know, just don't expect it to be a 100% success rate. Um, that expectation and taking that off my shoulder. If I can do it 99% of the time, uh, I'm thrilled and I'm really happy about it. So your parenting advice is just so on point as everybody has been commenting here, just how much they appreciate it. What about your parents? Um, they have let's, survived let's, uh, COVID. Um, let, let me just push on that a little bit. That. Let me just push on the parenting one yeah. more time. Okay. Grace is so important. Um, and grace really doesn't start with other people. It starts with ourselves. And so being okay, learning from the mistakes that we make. And I always, when, whenever I make a mistake, I like to sort of take it apart a little bit about, well, what happened? You know, why did I say that inappropriate thing at dinner? And, you know, was it I was stressed about my parents? Was it I didn't sleep well the night before? Did I go too long without eating? Did I have a low blood sugar? So how people deal with cravings and behavior, it actually starts with biology and sleep, blood sugar, critically important. There's a great study of 107 couples that um, they measured their blood sugar before bedtime and then they gave them voodoo dolls and they asked them to express their feelings about their partners with the pins in the dolls. And the people who had the lowest blood sugar had more than twice the number of pins in the dolls. And my wife will tell you if she's hungry, you know, I better mobilize because she gets irritable when she's hungry. And so just know, you know, if I yelled at the kids, well, what was going on? Was it stress? Was it blood sugar? Was it sleep? What? So to my parents, uh, it's been quite the wild ride. And I'm one of seven. And, uh, you know, I've, I've been the doctor in the family for a long time. Yeah. And, uh, and, and the last six months have been a nightmare. In November, my mom broke her hip. And then... Um, and I thought that was going to take her out. She's 88. Uh, well, it didn't. And then in January, she got shingles. And I'm like, what? And then in early March, uh, my dad had a bleed where he literally lost a quarter of his blood. He had a GI bleed. And we couldn't find the source. And it was a nightmare. And he's in the hospital. Um, and then when he gets out, he's just tired and has a cough and COVID's happening and um, you can't really get tested, but I had tests at Amon Clinics. So my niece who I adore went over, tested both my mom and dad and they both came back positive. <laughs> and they ended up in the hospital and I had already planned because I had read the early studies from China on hydroxychloroquine. And so um, I put them both on that, my mom also is EPAC because she had pneumonia like 10 times. And I sort of had a sense pneumonia was gonna take her out. And five days later, they came out of the hospital. Um, That's amazing. But, it, but it's been really hard. Uh, my mom bounced back. My dad, unfortunately, died yesterday. And, I didn't know that. Yeah. Uh, no, I, I know so you didn't sorry. know. I'm sorry. Yeah, it was heartbreaking. But 
Oh. But we all die. And, and, and I'm not minimizing what I feel because I loved him dearly. But, you know, and, and he didn't die from COVID, which was really, um, I don't know if it's good or bad. He, he, it was his heart that um, with the bleed and then the infection and then respiratory having problems. Um, I'm so sorry for your loss. Yeah, no, thank you. And so I went to bed last night and I, I practice these habits all the time. And there are so many beautiful parts of yesterday uh, from the love. I mean, you can't have funerals now. And if we had one, there'd be a thousand people. But now probably part of it will be virtual and we'll probably have 10,000 people because he was just loved so much by not only his 50 grandchildren and great grandchildren, but he was a grocer and was actually the leader of the California Grocers Association. And so you think of now first responders, it's also yeah. my siblings, because four of my siblings work in the grocery business and they're first responders too, with a lot of anxiety and fear. So, you know, so today is about honoring him and really being worried about my mom because when you've woken up next to someone every day for 70 years, mm -hmm. that that part is so disorienting. And, and it's funny, it's not funny, it's, it's odd. I'm working on a brand new public television special for this time with Tana and it's called Overcoming Anxiety, Trauma and Grief. And I'm like, whenever I do something like that, I know part of it will, um, I'll experience it per personally. I'm, uh, you know, I, I did not know about this ahead of time. And I, I almost am shocked, even that you didn't cancel our Instagram live. Um, and your strength is really, is amazing to me. You're finding joy in the day. You're finding, I mean, we can't even go through the normal grief process because of all of this. As you say, the, the funeral has to be virtual. How are you coping with grief in this time? How are you getting through it? Because a lot of people are going through the same thing. Yeah, no, it's something I've thought about for a long time. And, and one of the most helpful things for me personally, um, besides my faith, that helps me a lot is when I was in college, I took a death and dying class and I got introduced to Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, who was a psychiatrist who specialized in that. And we all wrote our funerals. And if you live with the end in mind, if you know it's happening, you just, and, and she said something so beautiful that if you deny death, people are vulnerable to live meaningless, purposeless lives. Because when you live as if you're going to live forever, you don't take care of the relationships and the things you need to do today. And so for me, I've just always known this is temporary and I live with purpose of helping other people. And that helps me. It just helps so much. Uh, and it's a process. I have this great patient that I just dearly love. She lost her 12 year old daughter, Sammy to bone cancer. And then she did all the wrong things. She went to bed, she drank a lot of alcohol, ate a lot of bad food, and on her five foot two frame ended up to be over 200 pounds. And on the two year anniversary of Sammy's death, she had secretly planned to kill herself. And she had three other children and a husband. I mean, she was clinically severely depressed. And then she saw one of my shows on public television. She saw Change Your Brain, Change Your Body. And she tells me this little lecture. <laughs> she said, well, I'm gonna go get that book. And if it's a bad book, I'm gonna kill myself tomorrow. <laughs> She's <laughs> telling me this. And 
She said, but it was so simple and so easy to do. And I stopped drinking immediately. And I stopped eating bad food and I put on tennis shoes and I started to run. And I met her 10 weeks later and she was down 35 pounds. And she said, in about eight days, I got myself back where I didn't wake up in a panic. And she said, I want you to tell people you talk to, never let grief be your excuse to hurt yourself. You, um, you know, people are chiming in actually. Somebody just said, Dr. Amen, you saved my life. Um, your books, your, your story that you just shared with us now, um, it's a reminder to everyone that there are ways to get mentally healthy. There are ways to correct trauma and to live through grief. What, um, in your final thoughts, would you say to a lot of the people out there who are struggling in this time, who are grieving either their past lives that they had before March 2020, whether they're grieving the loss of a loved one as you are, um, what is sort of your, your end message to everybody out there? You know, there are a couple of therapies people should look into. One of them is called EMDR, eye movement desensitization and reprocessing. It's a very wonderful therapy for past trauma. And there's another therapy I like to do with my patients called timeline therapy, where you actually look at the line of your life uh, from the past to the future. And where do you see the past. So just imagine a line coming from your body. And um, for me, I see the past behind me. And I see the future ahead of me. So I don't allow the past to infect the present and the future. The past informs it, but it doesn't infect it. And so in this time, um, and C.S. Lewis said this so beautifully, uh, he wrote a piece in 1948 about the atomic bomb and why we're worried. You know, we're so worried about the atomic bomb when so many other things are going to get us, whether <laughs> it's cancer or heart disease or whatever. And he's like, well, if the atomic bomb, when it comes, find, let it find me doing sensible things like playing with my children and making dinner and um, playing darts with my friends. Um, we are going to get through this and you'll get through it better if you take care of your brain and you have good mental hygiene. Um, and the world is going to look different, but we're still going to love each other. We're still going to want to help each other. We still want to be purposeful. Um, and as you go through your day, another little tiny habit, just ask yourself, is this good for my brain or bad for it? And if you can choose the right thing, you're going to be smarter. And you choose the right thing, not because you should, but because you love yourself and the people around you. Perfectly said. I could sit on this uh, Instagram live and talk with you for another four hours. <laughs> um, I do want to point out that book you have behind you. It's an incredible book for anyone who's viewing and is not um, aware if this is the first time you've met Dr. Amen, um, the end of mental illness. It's just an incredible journey on how to end the stigma of mental illness and also to uh, give you these resources that you've walked us through in the last hour on how we can keep our brain healthy. Dr. Amen, I am sending you love and prayers to your family in this time and your loss is, uh, is on my heart and I am thinking about you. And I just want to thank you for the incredible gift that you give people every day. Um, if you don't follow Dr. Amen, go right now to his Instagram page. He will redirect your day uh, when you need it most. So thank you so much. What a joy to see you again, Lynn. You too. You too. I've been thinking about you, sending you prayers and love. Thank you so much. Take care. Bye.